Section 5.4, inverses, contrapositives, and indirect reasoning. Our first definition, negation. The negation of a statement has the opposite truth value. A contradiction is a statement that goes against the truth. Here's an example. Number one, Pittsburgh is the capital of Pennsylvania. We know that that is false. But what I want to do is negate this statement. To negate the statement, I'm going to use the same statement, but in here, I'm going to put is not. So I will just write Pittsburgh is not the capital of Pennsylvania. So what I did is take the original statement and I negated the statement by adding a not into the statement itself. Number two, the moon is not the closest star to the earth. That is the truth. Notice it already has the not in it. So what I'm going to do to negate the statement is to remove that not. So here I'll just write from the negation, the moon is the closest star to the Earth. And each of these have a truth value. Pittsburgh is the capital of Pennsylvania. We know that that is false. A contradiction to that would be that we know that Harrisburg is the capital of Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh is not the capital of Pennsylvania. We know that is true. Number two, the moon is not the closest star to the Earth. We know that that is true. On the second part, we have a negation of that statement. The moon is the closest star to the Earth. We know that that statement is false. And we also know a contradiction to that would be the sun is the closest star to the Earth. On previous sections, we've learned a couple of things that need to go along with this section. The first one is a conditional statement. Remember that a conditional statement is written in the form of if P, then Q. It's also written as if P, then Q, but instead of then, we have the symbol written as an arrow. Recall also that P is our hypothesis. Q is our conclusion. And this can be true or false. And if it's false, we always want to have a contradiction that disproves the statement. Also recall, we've written the converse of our conditional, and the converse of our conditional is written as if Q then P. All we did is switch the hypothesis and conclusion in our statement. And that will also have a truth value to it. Here's an example. Given the conditional statement, find the converse. The first thing to do is to identify the hypothesis, which is our guess on solving the problem, and then we have the conclusion. So let's read the problem. If the polygon is a triangle, then it has three sides. Well, our hypothesis, if I have a polygon, it's a triangle. That is our P. Our Q, if that polygon has three sides, then that is our conclusion. So we want to write our if P then Q, our original conditional, in the form of if Q then P. And then we'll go back and decide whether both are true or false. So if we write this as if Q then P, recall we want to write this in the form that makes sense to us, a real sentence. So I'm going to write if, and I will add some words here to make this sound better and make sense to us. If a polygon has three sides. Then it is a triangle. Now let's verify which are true or false. If the polygon is a triangle, then it has three sides. That's true. That is the definition of a triangle, a polygon with three sides. Here, if a polygon has three sides, 
then it is a triangle. That's true also. In this case, the conditional and its converse are both true. We've already looked at the conditional and the converse. We want to add two more definitions to that. Here we have the inverse of the conditional statement. That is when we negate both the hypothesis and the conclusion. In other words, if not P, then not Q. And we write that in a shortcut version as if not P, then not Q. And these symbols represent the term for not. Also notice, the inverse is the original conditional, just written as a negation. Contrapositive of the conditional switches the hypothesis and conclusion, but it negates both the hypothesis and conclusion. So here, if not Q, then not P. And we can write that with symbols. If not Q, then not P. Notice this is the converse written with the negation. On this slide, we want to summarize the last four definitions. Conditional, converse, inverse, contrapositive, give an example and determine the truth value of it and also write a contradiction if it's false. Let's start out with the conditional. If P then Q. Here, even though this statement is not written in the exact form of if P then Q, we do have a hypothesis and a conclusion. And we can, in our mind, state the if P then Q. If angles are vertical, that's my P, then those angles are congruent. That's Q. Vertical angles are congruent. That is a true statement. That's from a theorem that we've had in the past. Converse. Here we want to write this statement in the form of if Q then P. If angles are congruent, then those angles are vertical. This statement is false. And I know that because I can create a segment and another segment perpendicular to it, and I know I've created two congruent angles. They are not vertical, but they are congruent. And that is a contradiction to this statement. So that's false. Inverse. I want to take the conditional and negate both the hypothesis and conclusion. So here, if angles are not vertical, then those angles are not congruent. So let's reread the inverse. If angles are not vertical, then they can't be congruent. That is a false statement. As previous, I can draw a diagram. Here, I can give you two angles, both 60 degrees, and I know two 60 degree angles are congruent. And here I've demonstrated they're not vertical, but they're still congruent, and therefore it's false. We can come up with multiple contradictions in both of these problems. Finally, the contrapositive. We're going to negate the converse. So here I have if angles are not congruent, then those angles are not vertical. Let's reread and take a look. If angles are not congruent, 
then they can't be vertical. That's true. Because if I end up with vertical angles, we know that the angles would have to be congruent. On this example, we're asked to write the inverse and the contrapositive of each conditional statement, then state the truth value of each and give a contradiction of its false. Here's our original conditional. Let's identify the hypothesis and conclusion. If two angles are a linear pair, then they are supplementary. Two angles are a linear pair is P, hypothesis. They are supplementary Q, conclusion. Well, if we have a linear pair, then I know that angle one and angle two have to be adjacent. And if they're adjacent, that means they add up to 180 degrees because a linear pair sum must be 180, and that means they're supplementary. So this statement is true. Next is the inverse. And we know the inverse is the negation of the converse. If not P, then not Q. So we want to write this in this form, but we want it to make sense. So here, if two angles are not a linear pair, then they are not supplementary. So I have to start with two angles that aren't a linear pair. So all I have to do is create two angles. I'll call this one 110 degrees. And I'll call this one 70 degrees. Notice they're not adjacent. They don't form a line. Therefore, they're not a linear pair. So this is true. And this says, well, then they can't be supplementary. But if I add 110 and 70 together, their sum is 180. Therefore, these two angles are supplementary. Therefore, this statement is false, and that's his contradiction. Contrapositive. We want to write that in the form of if not Q, then not P. So we take our inverse and switch it around. So we're going to say, if two angles are not supplementary, remember it has to make sense, then they are not a linear pair. Now we have to determine if that's true or false. Two angles are not supplementary, then they can't be a linear pair. That is true, because a linear pair's definition is two angles that are adjacent and also supplementary. So that is true. If I can't have supplementary angles, I can't have a linear pair. On this slide, we want to take a look at the Venn diagram. And we want to write the conditional illustrated by that Venn diagram, then write its contrapositive. So here, the original conditional, if P then Q, we're going to let the triangle be P and the conclusion be the outer circle polygon. So we're going to write as the original conditional, if the figure is a triangle, then it is a polygon. And I always like to determine the truth value. If the figure's a triangle, then it's a polygon. That is true. Now they want us to write the contrapositive. The contrapositive is if not Q, then not P. 
So we're going to start with the outer circle. So the figure is not a polygon. Then it is not a triangle. So let's determine if this is true or false. If the figure is not a polygon, then it's not a triangle. This is true also because a triangle is a polygon. On this slide, we want to take a look at indirect reasoning. This is when all possibilities are considered, then all but one are proved false. The remaining possibility must be true. In other words, we want to create a proof, and at the end, we want to find a contradiction in that proof that must prove what we're really trying to get at for the actual answer of our proof. So what we're going to call that type of proof is an indirect proof, a proof involving indirect reasoning. Here's the procedure, and we must follow this procedure. Step one, we want to write a statement that assumes the negation of what is to be proved. So we take the proof statement, and we write that as a negation. And we do write the word assumes. Step two, we then logically work through the proof as we had in two-column proofs. But here we're going to write a paragraph proof, very similar to a two-column proof. Uh, we're just not going to have the actual two columns. But we're going to work in the same procedure as we have in the past. Step three, after we work through the problem, we're going to come up with a contradiction. In other words, what we have as our solution will contradict the given in our statement. Therefore, what we assumed at the beginning must be false, and we end up with the reality of what we tried to prove. And our last step is to actually write, but this contradicts the given, therefore, and then we write the actual proof statement. On this slide, we want to write the first step of an indirect proof. In other words, we take what is to be proved, and here it is snowing outside is what we want to prove, and we write the negation of that. So our statement would be, assume it is not snowing outside. Number two, here our proof statement is segment AB is less than or equal to segment MN. We want to write that in an indirect proof, and we do that by saying, I want to assume AB is greater than MN. And notice I do not have the equal sign here because that is part of our proof statement. Number three, I have the proof statement to be the figure is not a square. I want to assume the figure is a square. On this slide, we want to identify two statements that contradict each other if we're given three. So let's read through them. Number one, angle A and B are congruent. Number two, two angles form a linear pair. And number three, two angles are vertical. Two angles, A and B, are congruent. And if I take a look at number two, two angles form a linear pair. Two angles forming a linear pair are two adjacent angles that add up to 180. Is there a way that those two angles could be congruent? The answer is yes. They both could equal 90 degrees. So therefore, these two angles could be congruent and still form a linear pair. On the next one, two angles are vertical. Well, two angles being vertical do form congruent angles. So in this situation, one does match up with two. There's no contradiction that that is a possibility. One matches up with three. That is a possibility. But here, two angles forming a linear pair must be adjacent. And that contradicts with the last one, two angles are vertical, because these must be in non-adjacent angles. So therefore, our contradiction is on statement two and statement three. Our next set says, number one, I have MN congruent to PQ. Number two, segment MN is perpendicular to PQ. Number three, MN is parallel to PQ. Let's see if we can get a relationship between one and two. I have two perpendicular segments. I have two congruent segments. It so happens that I could have these segments be perpendicular and also be congruent. So these two could match up. Here I have two segments being parallel, but I also could have those two segments being congruent. So one and two match up, one and three match up. But 
uh, segments being perpendicular and those same segments being parallel contradict each other. Therefore, the contradiction relies on statement two and three. From the previous two slides, we want to conclude with an indirect proof. Here, we're given a diagram, and in that diagram, we're given that segment AB is less than segment AC. What we want to prove is segment AD is not a perpendicular bisector of BC. A couple of slides ago, we know the procedure to solve an indirect proof. Our first step is to assume the negation of our proof statement. So we would write, assume AD is a perpendicular bisector of BC. Knowing that information, we can easily get the left triangle ADB congruent to ADC. And hopefully that leads to a contradiction of what we know is to be true. So let's continue with that process. Some of these don't have to be the order I have, but I solved them in this method. In this situation, we know that BD is congruent to segment DC because of the definition of a segment bisector. And in my diagram, I can put tick marks to represent that. I can go to the next statement and say that AD is equal to AD by the reflexive property. And on the next step, I can say that the measure of angle ADB is equal to the measure of angle ADC because perpendicular lines form congruent adjacent angles. And also, you can see I'm writing this as a paragraph form rather than a two-column proof. That's the way we like to do our indirect proofs. Now, since I have the diagram marked, I can see that I have two triangles congruent, and I can identify triangle ADB equal to triangle ADC, and that's by the side angle side postulate. Continuing on that statement, after I know that I have two triangles congruent, I'm allowed to say that segment AB is equal to segment AC by CPCTC. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. But from my truth statement, which is the given, AB is less than AC. I have now reached a contradiction. I know this cannot be true. And if this is not true, then I know that my assumption that I have at the beginning is not true. So I always end up with, but this contradicts the given, which is AB equals AC, and AD is not the perpendicular bisector of segment BC, which is what I wanted to prove originally.